How to Biz Dev, a Tumu story. Tumu's partner with family focused organisations to solve meaningful problems in delightful ways. Tumu's is the family division of a company called Tubles. Tubles is a product consultancy agency that's been around since 2009 and we've got offices in New York and Melbourne. We have lots of really cool clients. So I'd like to start with the story of how I learnt my version of whatever is business development. So one of these two characters is me. I used to work at places like ABC in Australia. I worked on the Degrassi website in Toronto and I worked at uh, Sesame Street in New York for about eight years. And during that time, I hired a lot of great game studios from around the world. Uh, big shout out to Firefly, who's based in Sydney. And together we made a ton of great websites and games for kids TV shows. And I've gotten a few cool awards along the way. I had no interest whatsoever. I thought it was really, really not for me. I was a producer, I was creative, I got to come up with game ideas and go into ideation meetings and uh, I just thought business development was the absolute opposite of what I thought I loved doing. The vendors that I absolutely loved, what I thought was that they were just my mates and I was having a really good time but they were also really talented. But I realise now that they were actually pulling a BD on me. So I thought I'd tell you about the five things that I learned from my vendors about BD. Let me count the ways. One of the things that I really liked about my favorite vendors was that not only were they really professional, got the job done, did a really great job, but you could actually hang out with them and you could have lots of fun with them. So if they were in the same city or if we happened to be at a conference together, um, we would catch up and have a drink or a meal and we would very rarely talk about work. It was just getting to know each other. That's a really great form of BD and it really also, um, you know, really solidifies the trust and the relationship um, with that vendor and client and makes the client want to work with them over and over again, which is what I did with uh, a few of my vendors. My favorite vendors that I used to hire I had 100% trust in, we were totally honest with each other all the time and they felt like true collaborative partners in anything we did. So, you know, we went through the fire together, we got the accolades together and we worked really, really hard together and everyone was in it together. Lots of togethers there. My favourite vendors made me feel like I was their favourite client. And in hindsight, I'm pretty sure that, you know, they were like this with all of their clients. In addition to the, you know, honesty and trust and sense of kinship and collaboration, this, uh, like, sense of paying attention to us always carried through all the projects. You sometimes get vendors who, uh, you know, after a few projects, they start to treat you like the second class client because you're not as important anymore because you're used to them. But for our favorite vendors, they would always treat us like we were number one. And that really goes a long way to forming a really long lasting, you know, collaborative business relationship with them. Now, my favorite vendors would also go above and beyond, always delight and surprise me in the quality of work, the professionalism of work and the care they gave to our projects. So sometimes you get vendors who, you know, are very, very capable and you know very very nice but they are pretty transactional and they'll you know deliver they'll send you what you need and they will, will basically do the least amount of work it's not a bad thing it's just that when you have a vendor who always goes above and beyond your expectations if they deliver art for example that is you know far better than you thought that they would deliver if they're able to deliver, deliver, you know, one additional feature that, you know, we, everyone thought that they couldn't um, because of time, it's just showing that they really care about your project and they really want to work with you to make it succeed. I'm not saying that these, these vendors should be, um, you know, breaking their budget to do that. I'm just saying that these guys always showed that they really cared about the project and really wanted to do a really good job collaboratively with us. Finally, my favorite vendors didn't 
just go silent once the project was finally delivered and the final invoice by us was paid. You know, you get a lot of vendors who finish the project then they have to move on to a dozen other projects, which I experience these days. What was nice about my favorite uh, vendors was that they would just keep in touch every so often. They might email me to let me know about a project um, that they'd launched or something interesting that they'd found on the internet or just to say hi or if they're in town they drop in for a drink. Uh, it wasn't spamming, it was just kind of letting me know that they still existed and they still you know were around if I wanted to send them work basically. So it was really it was a really nice you know like informal way of um, you know keeping the business development relationship alive. And my favorite vendors they never made the experience just transactional. They always showed that they cared. The best vendors always made our project feel like a true collaborative effort. So that's what I learned from my vendors and now I am the vendor so I wanted to tell you my approach to biz dev. So like many digital studios, Tumus are a service-based company. So that means that we earn our money by providing digital services, aka making games, instead of selling digital products. So instead of making our own games and putting them on platforms, we actually get paid by the likes of Disney and Sesame and PBS Kids to create games that they will publish. So they own all the rights to the code and art and everything once they're done and we just get paid for it. As part of my job as managing director of Two Moves, I do a load of pitching and meetings and I write a ton of proposals. The work is super creative and I love it. Now I'm going to show you how we do our version of BizDev at Two Moves. I'll take you through how we set goals, how we create a BD pipeline tool, how we try and get our name out there, how we write proposals, how we excitedly win work, how we ensure we do an amazing job for our client and how this can help your clients become your sales team effectively to win more work. Tip one, set goals. So we've got two types of goals, aspirational goals and actionable goals. So here's an example of the aspirational goals that we've set for 2019 and 2020. They're really high level. They're meant to be collective goals that excite the team in the type of work that they want to do and the type of people that they want to work with. Now, in addition to the aspirational goals, we also collectively came up with a small set of actionable goals. These aren't tied to any performance bonuses or anything like that. It's really an actionable set of items we think that we can achieve that we do want to achieve together. So for 2019, we had three sets of core goals. One was growing older. So basically we wanted to do more work beyond preschoolers and kids and age up into teens and families. We wanted to grow bigger. So we wanted to diversify our clients and the types of projects that we worked on. And we wanted to continue to find more partners to share our values about finding projects that have positive impacts to society. And we wanted to grow smarter. So we knew that we had skills that were underutilized or we had skills that we wanted to develop in house. And that would enable us to do different types of projects that we wanted to do. And we wanted to show to the world that we are world-class in our talent. Tip two, have a BD pipeline. We've used a lot of different types of pipeline tools over the years. We've used things like Copper and um, Salesforce and a few other tools. For our company, we've discovered that using a Trello board that exports information to Slack channels is actually the best way for us. One of the great things about this approach is that it's much cheaper than CRM tools and you can integrate it into your existing tools already. So this is the tool that we like. It's the one that works for us. You should try and find a tool that works best for you. Initial conversation. When you first meet someone or get an email from them or have a lead or get a business card, this is where you can put that information. 
active discussion. That's where we put leads where we think we're about to get an RFP or we know that they will be sending us an RFP or there's a potential for future meetings or actionable items. Highly likely working on it. Highly likely means we've been in active discussions with a client and with or without a proposal, it's very likely that we will secure some work with them. Working on it for us internally means that we've either received a request for more information or for a quote or an RFP, which is the request for proposal, and we are currently in the middle of working on it. And part of this is demonstrably showing that we deeply understand their project needs and that we can solve their problem and we can do it really well and better than the competitors. Proposal sent. So this is pretty self-explanatory. We've sent them the proposal or we've sent them the quote or whatever documentation that they required to make a decision. Usually you wait a couple of weeks to get a response. In some cases we've waited months and considered a project iced before uh, it comes back to life and suddenly we've won a job. Um, if you are not sure, it's always a good idea to gently chase the client up to see if they've made any movement or progress, but we try not to hassle them too much. Negotiating. So probably around 90% of the time that we submit a proposal, if we've been selected as the vendor, the client will often change everything about the project. So the budget, the timelines, even some of the creative can all just be chucked out the window and they almost start again from scratch. So in addition to negotiating a budget, part of the negotiation is also negotiating what the contract is going to be in terms of the creative, the schedule and deliverables. So this is a really important point where you need to know that what you have put in your proposal or know what you've put in your revised proposal is very likely going to go into the contract. So you have to be really sure that you can deliver on what you've promised in that document. So you've won the project, which is super exciting, but also you've won the project, which is super terrifying because you have to now do the job. So this is the point where I hand it off to the team and they get to do all the hard work. Usually it starts by understanding who needs to get resourced on this project, who are the best fits, who's available. Um, and as soon as possible, we try and get the contract finalized because a project actually is never won until you've signed on the dotted line. You really need to make sure that you put a lot of focus and effort in moving that contract forward to signature so you can start working and getting paid. Tip three, getting your name out there. So it's pretty daunting when you're trying to get your name out there at first. When we first started as two moos, we had the fortune of knowing people already in the industry. One of the good things that you can do in Melbourne is go to meetups, uh, go to conferences like GCAP, meet and talk to people. The best way to get to know people is to meet people face to face, because if they can see you in person, they can see your face, they can get a sense of your personality, they can really get a sense of if they would like to work with you or not. A good first step is to contact people by email to see if you can set up a time to meet, whether it's on Zoom or in person. Obviously right now we can't do in person due to COVID. Um, if you don't have their email, LinkedIn is your friend. Uh, it's a really powerful tool for making introductions and getting to know people. Try and connect with people, send them a short note telling them who you are. If you can have a link to a portfolio or information about yourself, that's great. And that's a really great first step to trying to get them to get interested in you. Um, once you have their attention via email or via LinkedIn, if you can then set up that um, phone call or that video call, or as I said, better still, meet up for a coffee or get them to visit your office. That is the best way for them to get to know you and the company and how you work. So uh, if you're shy and you hate talking to strangers, I don't have much advice to give because I'm 
actually a very shy person myself and I hate talking to strangers. I get quite anxious. Um, but one of the great tips that someone did give me was that people simply like to talk about themselves. So if you find yourself talking to a stranger and you're not sure about what to talk about, simply ask them about them. Tell me about your life. Tell me about where you're from. People love to tell a good story about themselves. And so basically you can just sit back and listen and just keep prompting them to keep telling their story. The best places to get to know people to do this, um, if you're at places like a conference um, or at an event, is actually not during the conference, but um, at the drinks and the after party, that's when everyone is relaxed. Uh, again, you don't want to really talk about work. If you happen to be talking to someone you don't know, again, just talk to them about themselves. Ask them, you know, where they're from. So if you are talking about your company or about your team or the work that you do, keep it focused, high level and to the point, unless the client is asking you to go deeper into it. You want to know your subject. You also want to be yourself and let your personality shine through. It's also good to ask the company about them and how they work and the kind of work they do, um, just so you can get to know them personality wise as well. Above all, uh, I really highly recommend you be yourself. You have fun uh, and you also keep it um, on time. Don't go over time. So I mentioned earlier about having a portfolio deck or an introductory deck ready. Uh, if you've got work that you can show this potential client, I just wanted to show you uh, one of our recent ones. So we've got a really nice, simple um, statement. We're playful engineers. We have a vision statement. We partner with family focused organizations to solve meaningful problems in delightful ways. We have a really clean list of clients. Um, this is not all of our clients, but depending on the person that we're pitching to, we tailor the summary of our clients to that person. Uh, we want to give people a sense of who we are and the scope of where we work. So we are the uh, Melbourne of the USA and we are the Brooklyn of Australia. And we also want to give these people a sense of our company structure. Uh, one of the things is for us personally, our old uh, clients that we've worked with for many years still think of us as a tiny little group of, you know, like five or six people at two moves who scrabble together to get some really great work done. But we're actually, we've grown over the years. So we're actually much bigger and we're, um, you know, we've got like 20 staff, I think, on our team. So this was um, a page that we wanted to show people visually in a few seconds, the structure of our company. It's also um, a bit confusing that Two Moose is a family division of Two Bulls because it's kind of not how, you know, game studios generally work, but it works for us. Um, we want to show that we know what we're doing in the space that we're pitching to. So in the case of this particular portfolio, we wanted to show that we knew kids content and that we were family focused, but that with two bulls, we also know health. So in this page, we are talking about how we know about how to, uh, to work with some really great health partners in this space and that we have the skills and the qualifications to do it well. We also wanted to show um, a page. We also wanted to show this page um, a few more than two, again, because a lot of our older clients who have been with us for quite a few years still think of us as a really small company and we have grown. So we want to visually show people that we are actually a more established company now. Um, and then we go into some of the um, projects that we've worked on. Early on, we started off by having a lot of text information about the projects that we had, like the year it was done, a summary of how we built it, um, a description of what it was, uh, you know, like people's reactions. But we just found over the years that people don't read that stuff. They want to see the information in a nutshell and they want to see and get excited by some really great graphics. Um, if you've won an award, um, or if you've gotten a newspaper like, newspaper article like we did on Forbes here, um, that's also a good thing to do. 
these uh, are actually a lot of these are actually animated GIFs. Um, so people who view the PDFs online can actually see certain things move. So I'll just keep going. So we've got lots of projects that we show people. Um, 3D systems, coding, Sesame Street, my favorite game, cookie cart racing, lots of PBS. Um, finally, uh, depending on the people that you're talking to, we really want to show people uh, our team and uh, a bit more about who we are and our backgrounds. This is especially important for potential clients who really want to know that your team has the um, capability and the skills to do the work that they need. So sometimes it's really good to have um, portfolios from your team. I like to have a cuddle page because it shows that we are awesome and that it just gives us a sense of personality really. So uh, this is our latest batch of um, puppers and kittens. Buster is my dog on the right. Finally, um, a thank you page should always have a um, contact. So if someone passes this around in their company, they'll always have my name so they can contact me if they want to do that. Tip four, writing proposals. So we have lost many proposals, but we have won many more proposals. Proposals are a time suck. There's no way around it. I don't know any vendor, uh, including ourselves, who have managed to figure out a successful way to balance project work and proposal work. The proposals, no matter how often you try and reorganize the process or try and fit it in to everyone's time, they always become a time suck. However, proposals are also really rewarding and can be really fun. I love writing proposals. I love collaborating with the team to write the proposals. It's really creative. And it also helps me become a better writer. Writing is uh, writing a proposal is actually really, really good exercise in improving your writing skills if that's what you want to do. Overall, summary is time suck, but they're very rewarding, especially when you're in the project. So here's what I've learned about what makes a good proposal for the client. A good proposal will quickly persuade the client that your team deeply understands their project. You'll successfully deliver on time and on budget, but also, and importantly, you'll be great to work with. A proposal is absolutely a team effort. As I mentioned, they're absolutely a time drain and a, they can completely get in the way of paid work but they're actually necessary to focus on in order to win future work. As I mentioned before, a proposal is basically like its own self-contained project. So like a project, you want to make sure that you've got your team ready, that you have organized everyone and they know when their deliverables are and when the, pro the project or this proposal is actually due. So uh, as soon as you get an RFP and you've digested it, I suggest that you set up calendar invites, um, start writing out tasks and deliverable dates and assign them to your team. Um, for initial brainstorms, which are the most awesome thing, we love to set up a one hour lunch or during this lockdown, a Zoom lunch, and we invite anyone in the company to take part. So for an hour, we all have this kind of like focused brainstorm session to see what we can like shuffle out in terms of ideas um, to put into the RFP. And there's something in the RFP that you don't understand or think is missing. Don't second guess or make assumptions. If you're unsure, email the client and see if you can get that clarified. It's always a really good idea to set up a meeting with the client to chat over your questions. In this case, uh, it's often good to just simply have a phone call or a Zoom chat. It's very important to set up the meeting with a client to go over these questions. So make sure that your questions are prepared. And then also make sure those questions are not already answered in the RFP. So that's where you really need to be thorough in your reading of all of their documents that they send through. 
It's also a great idea to send the client your questions in advance of the meeting. When I used to work on the client side, I used to uh, field the questions myself, but then I'd have to go to many different departments to try and get answers for that vendor. So for example, if there was a question about the technology, I would have to go and find one of the technical engineers to see what kind of response I should be giving back to you. So if you can get those questions to the client in advance of the meeting, that's super helpful. And then you can have a really short and efficient meeting to go over the answers, but also the client, even before you've won the project, already knows that you're super organized and super keen to win the project. Okay, a few more random tips, but they are very helpful, I hope. Um, when you're submitting a proposal to a client, uh, I highly recommend not attaching, but delivering it via Google Drive or Dropbox or some kind of share file, or do both. The reason is that attachments can sometimes get lost, or sometimes the attachments can actually get removed by that company's security filters. So it's really important that you are 100% sure that the client has received the attachment and can open it. Uh, a simple thing, but it's nice to just thank the client again for giving you the opportunity to submit. General niceties go a long way to really reinforcing to the client that you're the right personality fit for the job, that they know that they can get along with you and collaborate with you and your team if they chose you. If you want to let the client know something that you think is important about one part of the proposal or something that's in addition to the proposal, make sure you put it in the email just to really reinforce that that's something that you want them to focus on. So one of the big ones is sometimes you want a project really badly and so you're willing to negotiate the budget. If that's the case, you can put that in the proposal, but make sure you also put that in the email when you send them the proposal. For example, you could write something like, we're super keen to work on this project with you and uh, we're happy to negotiate the budget further. Importantly, if you don't hear back from them in 24 hours, I highly recommend just following up with them quickly to see if they've actually received your proposal. Sometimes they get lost in spam or you might receive an away notice that that person's on leave, but it's just really important to know that they've actually received your proposal that you've worked hard on and that you're not waiting around for a response to something that they never received. So I asked some of my clients what recommendations they would have that they could share for you on what makes a good proposal. Don't copy and paste from the RFP to your proposal. Write it in your own words. It shows you understand us and that you care about the product. We want to know that you understand and can deliver what we want, but can also bring even better ideas to the table. A proposal is like a job interview. It helps us understand your background, your abilities, and if you're a personality fit. An awesome proposal will challenge my assumptions and get my creative juices rolling. Final tip, tip five. What happens as a BD person once you win the work? There are two immediate stages of emotions when you win the work. The first one is pure ecstasy. Um, you're so relieved and so delighted. You've got this brand new project, potentially a brand new client that you really want to work with. Followed soon after by abject terror. Holy crap, you've got a new client. You've got to do this project. You've got to do it successfully. As a BD person, there is actually a third piece of terror in there. As a BD person, what you really want to know in the long term is can I retain this client long term? Can I form a long term relationship with this client? If it's an existing client, the question is, can I ensure that this project will successfully keep the client relationship going? Okay, so we've now won the work. We've been ecstatic. We got terrified and now the job has started. 
I always need to be across everything on all the projects that Two Moves is on. The reason being is that once I win the work with my team, I don't just step away. I'm actually with the team every step of the way during production through to completion. But I'm also with the client every step of the way through production to completion. And this is what I call the biz dev paradox. I am the advocate and champion for the client to my team, but I am also the advocate and champion for our team to my client. My advocacy for the client is to make sure that my team is holding the client's overall vision of the project and their end goal needs. Sometimes a team can get buried in the weeds and the tiny tasks that need to be done on a sprint by sprint basis. So one of my jobs as the client advocate is to look out for those moments when I feel that the team is going down a rabbit hole and bringing the vision back on track with the team before it even becomes a problem. When I'm advocating for my team to my client, it's often about supporting their reasons for making the decisions that they do and helping the client understand those decisions. So it's quite a tricky job sometimes. For example, a client might be insisting on a feature which we strongly believe is not necessary in order for them to meet their vision. This could be a feature that is near and dear to their heart and they're just obsessed with it because it's something that they've had in their head for ages, but it's actually not going to help the product or the end user. So my team has argued for removing that feature and the client has disagreed. So then it's my job if we feel strongly about disagreeing it because we want this product to be the best product it can be. My job is to help support the team in their decision and get on the phone with the client to help argue their case. Tip six, I am biz deving right now. At Two Moves, we love to share our knowledge and experiences with others, but we do want to grow awareness also of Two Moves in the industry. Talks are actually a really great way to do it, and bonus, you can always get free tickets. To summarise business development from my point of view, every single moment you have with a client in a project, every single moment in a client relationship is biz dev. Every single team member's interaction every conversation you have, every email you write, every document you make, every meeting you take, every deliverable you have, every success you have, every failure, and even every beer, and every talk, including this one.